Do you know what they call alternative medicine that's been proven to work? Medicine. Welcome to the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast, a show about energy healing, holistic, and plant medicine. Our passion is healing on all levels. You'll hear guests from doctors, yoga teachers, energy healers, researchers, coaches, and real people who've recovered from serious debilitating health conditions, getting to the root of the problem and solving it. And this is not medical advice. Welcome to the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast. And now your host, William Dickinson. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast. Today we are joined by Matt Rowe, who had a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis and is on his way to achieving a full recovery and is actually symptom free. And if that doesn't say full recovery to you, then I don't really know what does. So um, I'd love to ask Matt to introduce himself a little bit and tell us a little bit more about how he got into this line of work. Mm. William, I first I want to say thank you so much for having me My pleasure. on your podcast. This is absolutely amazing. So um, a little bit about me. Um, you know, I was the typical American that worked too much, had two kids, followed a very linear project or trajectory. And then in 2008, well, prior to that, I became all American triathlete, like athlete, all that kind of stuff. Wow. And then in 2008, I paralyzed my right leg from the waist down. Wow. So complete paralysis. Yeah. It, you know, I was dragging it around. So I, could, wow. I couldn't I could pick myself up on my right toes. So really, my dorsal flexion on my foot was gone. And really, when I would walk... I would drag it like mm -hmm. there would be an obvious limp. I couldn't run anymore. I couldn't cycle anymore. Everything that I had done for the previous five years was gone. And so really kind of took that into a moment of losing, you know, this realization of losing my identity of who I thought I was. So that led to depression and led to like this negative binge reel that kept playing on in my head. Now, I ended up recovering the leg, and then three years after I healed the paralyzed leg, I finished Ironman, which is, anybody that knows, it's wow. a 2.4-mile swim, 112-mile bike ride, and then you run a marathon all in one day. So there's no element of it's just being managed. It's like to be able to do that shows a significant level of healing and recovery. That's not, that's not even something a, an average person can achieve. So that's quite remarkable. Congrats on that. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, there was a lot of determination. And, you know, and I think the, the frustration of losing my identity really drove me to completing that because I knew I had to complete that. I wanted to finish that chapter in my life. But then it wasn't over. I just kept ignoring stress. I kept ignoring my body. I, kept, I didn't listen to my body at all. I didn't listen to the, I didn't really pay attention to the foods I ate and kind of just went right back into my old ways. Now, about two years later, I had another injury that led me to 25 to 30 strokes a day. Oh, wow. Yeah, that one was scary. Like I was more scary than the paralyzed. Yeah. Thing. Every time I stood up, the right side of my body would basically shut down for 10 seconds. And so, but there was a reason, as you know, in the universe and, you know, God source universe, whatever you believe leads you to specific things at mm -hmm. specific moments to pay attention. So this got me to pay attention to food. And so using food as medicine, really adjusting my gut microbiome and really taking a look at what I was putting in this beautiful machine, got it to a point that the strokes went away four months later after a neurologist had told me, this is, you're just going to have to live with this. So this was from dietary intervention alone. Dietary intervention alone. Wow. Yes. I think it's, so, the power of food is very underestimated in many cases. It's oh. It's becoming more, there's more awareness around it. Food is medicine, medicine is food, but still the power of it is underestimated, uh, I believe. 
It is. I mean, even if let's go back a couple thousand years, Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine mm -hmm. and medicine be thy food. So, I mean, this was something that we used for thousands of years prior to the medical society really coming around, around right around the 1940s, 1950s, when it started to really come out that they could actually do some science on some meds and stuff, because home homeopathy and food was actually used in that basis. Something I realized too during that journey of food as medicine and healing those is I realized some really scary stuff about our soils and how we are killing our soils, how the nutrient density in our fruits and vegetables have degraded by 90% since your grandparents ate them. And so really got me on this trajectory. But once again, William, I didn't pay attention. I went back into my old ways working a corporate job, high stress, doing that type of stuff. And then in 2017, I was diagnosed with primary progressive multiple sclerosis. At that time, I was told by my doctor, I had seven months before I was going to be in a wheelchair. If I didn't take their medication, didn't get on their, their disease modifying drugs that they had, that were only 27% effective. It's crazy, isn't it? When you, when you look at the numbers, it really makes you take a second look. And really, when you think about it, that's their numbers. Yeah. So you know they're <laughs> elevating the actual numbers yeah. itself. So when I really looked at it, and after doing all of this work with food as medicine, I said, you know what? There's got to be another way. And was led towards the book Medical Medium by Anthony William. Oh, I was led to all of this education just started showing up in my life. And I was a sponge. I wanted to know everything I could to reverse it. And really went on a trajectory for the next four years, not in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. maintaining my lifestyle, but really start flipped my life. So I started to go in started to go into my heart and I started to meditate. I started to really slow down and really take a look at what this world really is about. It wasn't about working a corporate job, more hours, doing the best, like doing all that type of stuff. It was about really loving and finding myself. So through, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, so that is, that's a, a very profound message that I find is the sort of the, the undercurrent or the theme behind a lot of people's healing. But I find it's so intangible and it's difficult for people that haven't achieved that state of awareness to understand that it's very easy to, so taken from my own personal experience, it's very easy to say like, I need to eat the right foods. I need to do the exercise I need to make my sleep right. How can you help to facilitate the understanding in others that our emotions are important, that the things that we're doing on a daily basis with our direction, with our passion, with our purpose are, are really important? How can you help to facilitate that jump in, in, in people's awareness? You know, and you brought up a really good point, is that that step, which means seemingly easy. I'm not asking you to dig a ditch. I'm not asking you to run a marathon, really just going in and sitting quietly with yourself can seem like the hardest thing that we do, yeah. but to facilitate the answer, to your question to facilitate that piece, it really begins with a first step. And this step is the hardest step you will ever take on. Really? The first step is the hardest step we take on any journey. Yeah. So when we actually take a look at this piece, it's really understanding who you are. So when we start to take a look at that, it's being com become aware of the negative thoughts inside your head. So because it's a binge drill, I mean, no one mm -hmm. tells you to wake up and think a specific way, but have you ever thought, what was your first thought when you woke up this morning? It's a good and question. So, <laughs> like, a good yeah. Question. And, and being honest with yourself, really, what was your first thought when you yeah. woke up this morning? Now, I do know the stats because I'm a, psych a psychology major, as this is what I'd studied for a while, is really when I took a look at this, is 80% of our thoughts every day are negative. Mm -hmm. So we're not nice to each other. And this is, nobody's telling us this, but what we tell ourselves. 
Then the other scary stat is 93% of your thoughts every day are automatic. Mm -hmm. They're subconscious. These are the thoughts that beat your heart. You breathe. I mean, you don't think about breathing, mm -hmm. but you're breathing. Your heart is beating. Your liver's functioning. Your kidneys are working. Like all of your bodily functions are working, but they're happening at a subconscious level. So your body is automatically doing it. Well, also at a subconscious level, your body is putting out specific thoughts, energy, and vibrations out there into the world, whether we know it or not. So that, that's, that's, that's the next pivot point, whether we know it or not. How do we become more aware of the energies that we're putting out, the vibration that we're emitting, the the thoughts that, as you said, they're just automatic. We didn't consciously think them. How, how can we increase our awareness around these things? So I think awareness, as you will agree, is the first step to changing these it things. Is. Yes. Once I'm aware, I can avoid it or not even avoid it. I can go through the storm. So oftentimes when we are aware of a thought, we have a negative thought inside our head. When that awareness happens, the scary part is most of us are not aware of the negative thought that plays inside our head. It just happens. And then we'll find ourselves sad or depressed or stressed out or frustrated or angry. I was in that camp. But once I become aware of it, once I became aware of it, then all of a sudden I noticed it when it came in. That's really I noticed, interesting. I noticed really the negative thought. Once I noticed it, I, had a, I could actually engage my prefrontal cortex where logical thought comes from, your conscious mind. And so once I was aware of this, con this subconscious thought or this thought that was just playing in, then all of a sudden I could make a different choice. Do you find that in your work, this is something that you help other people with because it's a lot easier to see other people's patterns than it is for you to see your own patterns. Yes. And it's interesting, the subconscious language that comes out, even for individuals that become aware of these thoughts and say, okay, I am, you know, I am thinking that, you know, so for example, think about what you say in the I am. I am, you know, not smart. I mm -hmm. am slow. I have, I have is another I am statement. I have multiple sclerosis. Yes, the diagnosis ties into that and then you adopt it and then you really do have it. <laughs> yeah, and so yeah. this becomes our identity and we, you know, we'll say we become the disease that we were diagnosed with. Then this starts to lead towards our mindset. Oh man, I'm worried about, you know, getting out of bed this morning. Am I going to walk today? Am I going to have a difficult time getting to the bathroom? Am I going to pee my pants? Like, I mean, it could be all of these things that play in your head. Then under that becomes your next step is your behavior is you'll go to your family members and you're frustrated. You outwardly show anger. So when you talked about energy going out is if I'm frustrated that, you know, if I identify that I have a disease, then that leads me to a negative mindset. Then my behavior that's going to outwardly project outwardly is going to be one of frustration, mm -hmm. anger, sadness, depression. And when that goes out, it just perpetuates this negative mindset. That's brilliant. Now, now what happens then is it takes another step. It goes to your actions. Mm -hmm. Because as human beings, we don't want to feel bad. We want to feel okay. So then we'll go do something like eat a donut or eat a pastry. That eating the donut or pastries, once again, it becomes a toxin within our body, mm -hmm. which then gives us the result of not feeling good. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes this perpetual cycle over and over and over. But we have an opportunity. If we stop it at the very first step of an identity and we start telling ourselves, I was diagnosed with, not have, I was just diagnosed with it. So it's then really it, about detachment there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Then this gives us this moment of hope. And we're like, okay. And then all of a sudden we're conscious of our thoughts that may have come in. Then we can start playing a different reel. Let's say at some point, 
we have written down affirmations and affirmation should always be written in the present moment, the I am. Mm -hmm. So when we write our affirmations, I am healed, my spine is healed. Then we can actually wake up in the morning making that statement and declaring that statement. Then we're not thinking about the fact that, you know, or am I going to step? Am I going to walk? Am I going to do all these things? Then we start to lead a different mindset, mm -hmm. different behaviors. And when we start to actually have a behavior of joy and love, our cells actually respond to this, this vibrational energy or this energy within our bodies that is really around mm -hmm. love and joy. Now, Will, you know this, you're going to get a new body in seven years. Yeah. Brand new. Heart, new lungs. You have a different body today than you did when you mm -hmm. woke up this morning. You have new cells right now. So your cells are just mass duplicating off of the blueprint of the cell that it's duplicating off of. So if vibrationally, we have energy that's going out that's negative, and they've done tons of studies with water, like if you are angry at water and you yell at water, they actually have seen the molecules inside the water actually are sharper, mm -hmm. they change. I've seen and those. so, I mean, you take a look at plants. All this stuff has that same, so when we're nice to plants, plants grow better because they're living creatures. So really under this essence is since we are a living creature, we can change the cells within our bodies when we are positive towards mm -hmm. them, when we're nice to ourselves. But it's, once again, I'm going to go back to that set, 80% of our thoughts are negative. So we have an opportunity. Our subconscious mind is a slave to the conscious mind. Okay. When we start thinking a specific way, and it takes a little bit of time, it can take, I've seen people do this in an hour. I've seen people do this in a year. It doesn't matter. As long as we're walking that path on that road, then all of a sudden we start changing our subconscious mind to actually repair, repeat, repeat our positive affirmations and what we want. And what we want to drive towards inside of our lives. So then once that change starts to happen, we'll start to notice the results. Remember the identity, mindset, behavior, and actions. Our actions, we start to eat a little bit better. Mm -hmm. We start to, you know, let's say we read something about a vegetarian-based diet, eating more plants and organic plants. And so we start to walk down this road and then we get curious about that. And we follow these threads of intuition inside of our lives that start to lead us to a result that we have declared. Okay. That's, I really like the trajectory of that, but I have a few questions because yes. I see this, this talked about, I wouldn't say a lot, but it's becoming more, 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 more trendy. More people are talking about this. Right. But how do you... How do you ensure that you don't fall into what I call toxic positivity, which is where you're using this, this, this optimism, this positive focus to just bypass and almost in a way form a sort of denial pattern about what's actually happening? How can we, how can we navigate that? Action. Action. So there are so many like uh, individuals, and this is stuff I saw, read when I was a kid is like you said, the toxic positivity. <laughs> and I love how you phrase that <laughs> is that it takes a look at it is just having a good thought is not enough. Think of that good thought that we have in our mind is a first step. <laughs> it, it allows us to slow down and pay attention to what's around us because we're constantly been being given answers day in and day out. It's whether we listen to them or not. Then taking another step, do we hear them? So I would imagine you've read, you read a lot and Hello, there, will, there will be a book that you'll read once, then you'll go back and read it again and pick up a statement, a word, a phrase that you never caught the first mm -hmm. time you read it because you're hearing it more. You're basically open to receiving that information. So then under that premise, if I have good thoughts going out, if I'm sitting there on a positive basis, yes, I am healed. So I'm declaring I am healed. I am walking. I am 
happy, I have love, I have joy, and I'm really declaring this all in the I am. If I stop there, that would only be the first step. Mm -hmm. And to get through all of this, you've got to go the entire staircase. But if I am positive, then I'll be able to see another step. And let's say that other step is um, I come upon, like, for example, with multiple sclerosis, I come upon Dr. Terry Walls, or I come upon Matthew Embry, or um, David Lyons with exercise. And let's say whatever is intuitively driven to me, I have a choice to take action on that or not. So that's another step. So let's say David Lyons, he's an MS fitness guru, and he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So then in that inspirational story, let's take this podcast, let's say, you know, I'm inspired. I'm, you know what, I want to listen to William's podcast. I heard of this guy, Matt Rowe. And so then that allows you to take that one step. Now, because I talked about food as medicine, maybe you're a little bit curious and you're like, what's this food as medicine stuff? And you look up uh, food that improves multiple sclerosis diagnosis. Then that allows you to take another step, but you still have to eat the food and make the choice. And so let's say you go to the grocery store and you start reading the label. And those are the actions you take. And as I read the label, I realize, you know what? I don't want to eat any corn, soy, dairy, gluten, pork, or eggs. Read Anthony Williams' book. Anthony Williams' book. Mm -hmm. Like he'll tell you about that in there. And that was something I did is I just, I didn't eat any corn, soy, dairy, gluten, pork, or eggs. Because they all have a level of toxins. in them. So one thing I noticed as a result, I felt better. I was walking better. So when I started this journey, I could only walk 800 steps before I had to stop. Today, I quit counting them at around yeah. 15,000. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and in the heat, so heat is a big thing for individuals with multiple sclerosis. Yes. You're in the heat that significantly decreases your ability to walk. So one thing that happens is, is I just got curious. How far am I going? Am I improving? And so I took that action of looking at these, you know, how many steps am I taking? I exercise. I am was an all-American triathlete. So yeah, I always exercise. Mm -hmm. So I still exercise four to five times a week. And so because of that, I kept taking action. So there was another piece with it though. I kept being, I kept being driven to the mind. I kept being driven to inside something bigger than me. So as I would sit quietly in meditation, I noticed breathing because as human beings, we don't breathe. I mean, you're breathing now, <laughs> but what happens is, is most of us take short hyperventilative breaths not Wim Hof method, but really just, mm -hmm. yeah. we're just taking a breath. We don't take a big deep breath to allow oxygen inside of our bodies. This is another step is as I walk through this, I realized, oh, I could do that to improve my body. Then I was led to a couple of doctors who are like, you know, parasites inside your body is a big thing that, you know, is attributed to multiple sclerosis. They're finding a correlation gut microbiome. So really in this action is all of these steps, but it all started with a positive mindset. Okay. So it's, positivity. it's taking that positive mindset, that positive focus and not just saying it and then continuing to do whatever has got you to where you are. It's about using that as fuel to change the direction and then actually take that action and aligning your behaviors behind the new way that you're thinking correct okay so because you okay. are an instrument you're it's all you are William you are an instrument you basically are the only one if you all believe you know everybody that you know we are made in God's divine image mm -hmm. in God's source universe whatever you believe we're all made in that image but God can't come down and say oh okay William I'll do your laundry for you Mm -hmm. you're the one that has yeah. to do the laundry. You have, you have the opposable mm -hmm. thumbs and the hands to go do it. Well, case in this is that no one can give you, nobody can tell you what to do, what to think, or say, you know what? You're just going to eat this every day. We all have a value inside of our life. 
And so when that value, so when it, you know, I work with clients is that's the first step is I really want to know what you value mm -hmm. as a person and they're different from it for everybody. Yeah. Once I know what you value, then you become a little bit more aware and then you'll take different actions, have boundary conversations, lead with love instead of frustration. And so in all of these steps allows us to be the person that we desire and who we want to be our true authentic selves. Okay. So would you say that the, the, the term healing is in essence sort of a, uh, a metaphor for just moving closer towards our authentic self-expression yes so you you believe that the symptoms the the diagnosis the illnesses the the disharmony that's occurring in the body is simply a i say simply it's a fairly complicated mm -hmm. thing to, to to perceive but it's just the fact that there is an element of the self that is not being authentically expressed correct and when it's not being authentically expressed it puts us out of balance okay working congruent okay so tying all of this together into a into a, in, an interesting question from from my perspective at least how can we integrate all of these authentic parts and simultaneously hold a positive focus what about the part of us that is hateful towards the government or can see how the soils are being destroyed and nobody's doing anything about it. And obviously there's a lot of powerful emotion there. And it's, you, you could argue it's, it's somewhat of a negative focus. What, what do we, what do we do about integrating those parts of ourselves so that we can express authentically while still maintaining that positive focus? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. So when you look at, you know, the destruction of our soils, like let's just take what's the war going on between russia and ukraine mm -hmm. like all of these pieces yes they are very real but we can do nothing about them in our current state so for example we can't go have a meeting with putin and say hey you know what you really shouldn't do this these are human beings and we can't so the only thing we could really do at that point is get frustrated and angry which brings more frustration and anger because energy inside of our lives gets duplicated. So with that, what I, could, what I express to my clients is, is that's the work, is that when we realize that these different things are inside of our lives that may turn us sideways, and if they are outward from us and we can do nothing about it, then, it's really, we have a choice of where we receive our information. So a lot of my clients, I want, if they're having struggles with the daily news, like their daily news, they look at it, it's the first thing they look at in the morning and it gets them upset throughout the day. Leads to stress, leads to anger. Then with that stress and anger cascades forward into a result of not walking very well. So then one of the steps is, is avoiding the news for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Not saying you're going to be ignorant, not saying that you're not going to pay attention to anything. It's you're making a conscious choice not to be turned or subjugated to that information that's coming in. So then really it comes back to the basis of to get through this is it's all within our bodies. It's all within our minds. It's all within ourself. So the only way to get through is through your own being, your own self as an individual, because I can't have, I can't tell you, William, exactly how you're supposed to be or what you're supposed to do or, how, you know, all these steps. You'll have to come up with that conclusion. And that is the work. And then it's under that decision of what do I value as a person? Let's say you value freedom. Let's say by looking at the news every day, you feel like your freedom is being taken away. You have fear that I could get injured when I leave the house. I have fear that, you know, I'm not going to walk very well. Or I fear that, oh my gosh, the, a nuclear war could happen. Or I fear of this. And what it's taking away is our freedom of being who we are as individuals. If we value freedom strongly, then this will lead us to stress. 
stress leads us to dis-ease. And so if we can actually take that first step of saying, you know what? No, I'm not going to engage with that right now. I'm going to allow my day to be like this when I wake up. And we make that conscious decision in our using our prefrontal cortex. And I can explain how this all works <clears throat> is most of us get an adrenaline adrenal response and the next chemical that is released inside of our brains, and it happens for everybody, is cortisol, which affects our clarity of thought. That's why you're a genius 15 minutes after an argument. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where you sit there, you're like, oh my gosh, why did I say that? Or man, I should have said this. Or we say, oh man, if that person does that again, I'm going to mm -hmm. come at it this way. And we want to attack and be right. But under a moment of stress it clouds your clarity of thought where your prefrontal cortex is. So if you have a negative thought when you wake up in the morning, then you'll go to your news and you'll open your iPad in your bed and you'll take a look at the news and go, oh gosh, I can't believe this is happening. And we get frustrated. Then we allow that to cascade throughout our day. But right there is you have a choice. When you woke up in the morning, you could say an affirmation. I attract people places and opportunities to enhance my life and prosperity. And I think about that right when I wake up in the morning, then I allow myself to wake up. Then I allow myself to go downstairs. I allow myself to drink my celery juice or whatever habit that you get into. And then let's say I read something that is positive. Let's say I read a book to increase my education. Let's say I sit in meditation before I go to work. Then I allow that to dictate my life instead of the negative news in the morning on that kind of side. So to answer your question, that is the work. The work is just being aware and so, making a choice. So to extrapolate that into, say, like solving these problems, for example, so the depletion, war, things like that, I think what, what you're, the, the point you're trying to convey is that even if these are things that are provoke, evoking negative emotions within you, you're never going to solve them by following that negative emotion, you have to instead pivot towards following what it is that you're supposed to do. And in essence, sort of surrender the outcome. Maybe you're not gonna play a hand in solving this problem with soil depletion or this problem with the war, but you're a little, a little sort of like a little pawn in a way. You've got your little job to do and you'll be directed to do that job if you're able to follow your positive affirmation and your positive emotion in the direction that you're being guided. Correct. Okay. And so, because, so for example, to make it a little bit different of a step point, mm -hmm. um, I cannot receive love from somebody else more than I can give myself love. So and for example, if, if I'm requiring love from somebody, let's say a spouse, children, and we go into this moment, oh, I just want to be loved. Just love me. Love me. What you're feeling is an empty hole of love. It's an empty cavern. It's the Grand Canyon. It's, you know, that huge canyon in the United States that you are trying to fill, which is impossible to fill. So I had one of my spiritual teachers tell me years ago that says a fire hose of love being poured into your heart will never fill your heart. But your own self-love only needs a thimble. Wow, that's lovely. That's really so, cool when we really start loving ourselves, then all of a sudden we are given opportunities inside of our lives to love deeper, to love more. And that love attracts more love. So for example, in the work that I do, there was at first a lot of like, oh, I've got the answers I know, but I was still living in this level of frustration. I just, I'm like, oh, just, I want this. I want that. When I stopped and actually started to love myself from within, I became full. Then all of a sudden I noticed different opportunities started to show up in my life. I wrote a book. I was led towards a summit. I was led towards all these things I really wanted to do to help other individuals this podcast that we're on today with you yeah. is really just all of this stuff started to open up inside my life, but I had to surrender and allow it to receive. So as I've told my clients is nothing can enter a closed fist. 
if I'm squeezing here and I'm squeezing as hard as I can, oh, come on, I'm going to make this work out of this frustration and anger. It really doesn't yeah. happen. Because your, hand your hand's closed, nothing. Right. When I open my hands and I surrender to it, and I surrender to the love I have, and I really start to love myself. One of the hardest things I ever ask any of my clients to do is go to a mirror. Every time you go to the bathroom, look in the mirror in your own eyes and say the words, I love you to yourself. It's, if you've never done it, <laughs> it's profound. Right. You'll think you're crazy. And no one's in the bathroom with you. You're there <laughs> all alone. You're looking in your own eyes and you're saying the words, I love you. So this is, it's a, yeah. that's a, in a way, that's an affirmation, right? That very much follows, it's in the present tense. It's following that same sort of thought pattern. So yep. how do we then, so how do we say it and then align our behaviors with that? How do we, how do we actually follow up? Well, that's a good point is if you really love yourself, will your behaviors automatically change? When you are in the grocery store, in the market, for example, and you're there and you're walking around, let's say in the past, people got in your way, they took the last item, they, it was frustrating, it was frustrating to get there, and we just led this world of frustration. It's fun with this is that when you really believe and live in a state of love for self, then different things come to your life. I, I noticed when I was in the grocery store, you know, for example, I was in the market and I was there and I was looking for something and this woman took the last one in front of me. And I'm like, oh, that's okay. I'm like, I didn't need it anyhow. So then my perspective changed. Mm -hmm. And it was in the next breath she looked at me and she goes, oh, I saw you were going to grab that too. I have an extra one at home. I really didn't need it. I just loved it so much. I was going to buy another one. Here, take this one. So then my outpouring of love attracted more love, attracted more opportunity inside of my life and attracted more things that were just surprise. You know, you know I, there's another word for God. It's surprise. Oh, and so when we look at this, God is just surprised. God source universe is just has all of these things inside of our life. If we are open to receive the surprise, if it's we see interesting. life as a surprise, pardon, it's very interesting. So surprise implies an element of lack of control of letting go, because if you're controlling everything, if you're aware of everything, if you're, if you know everything that's going to happen, there's no surprise. So you extrapolating that you're saying in order to to let this in let all this positive stuff in this surprise this, this beneficial pleasurable su lovely surprising experience you have to let go of control and allow it to and, and receive it so how, how do you do that um <laughs> surrendering so surrendering. really you know by letting go of the desired outcome so if we are all creators, so if you think about this and uh, let's say our belief is, is I am healed. Then I start going through my life and I start eating differently. I start walking through this different pieces of it. Then I'm surprised by what happened. Then I'm just like, oh, of course it did. Of mm -hmm. course that happened. And then I move on throughout my day. Now, remember the the key is action. We've got to take action on stuff. We are the instruments. We are the hands. A guitar doesn't play itself. And so really, we are the ones that has to strum it. So when we go through these elements of it, we've got to take action on these inspired thoughts and what comes into our lives. So what would you suggest somebody that gets stuck at that stage do? Sit quietly. So a lot of my clients, if they're like, I, I'm just, I'm in this state is just being aware, is just that level of awareness again, is saying, you know, when I'm stuck and then asking yourself the questions is, where do you feel stuck? We could say that, let's say you're going to holiday and you're gonna go to holiday with your family members, but man, you really don't like being with your mother or your mother-in-law because they're like, oh, they're just judgmental, they don't like it. And so I'm just stuck when I go there 
And instead of being stuck in that space, it's just being consciously aware that, okay, I am, I have this challenge with this individual that I'm going to go see. Then I have an opportunity to set a loving boundary conversation. It's really open up and say, you know what, I'd like to talk to you about something. When you say this, this is how it makes me feel. And I would like you not to do that anymore. Very easy to say, difficult to do is mm -hmm. in that statement, but with the support. And if we go back to this element of loving ourselves, if we really love ourselves from within, wouldn't we have that conversation with somebody? And then you could ask yourself the next question is what there was, what I'm thinking about them, the trigger event that they're going to say, is it true? Is the negative thought inside my head, whether it's coming from somebody else, like somebody doesn't have to be negative for me to think that they're negative. Mm -hmm. So I can ask myself the question, is it true? Is that thought true? And when we're honest with ourselves, we find that it is not. Those yeah. thoughts are just our thoughts. Then we can sit there and say at some other point is because that thought is not true, we can make a different decision of how we want to be with that individual. So if a trigger event is going to happen, we can very kindly and lovingly approach them, not, you know, out and, you know, we don't sit there passive aggressively, mm -hmm. you know, let's say we're all sitting there at the kitchen table and we go, oh, you, I can't believe you said this and I want you to stop that. We wouldn't do that. We would pull the per person, we would look for our opportunity to pull the person aside and say, hey, when you say this, it really doesn't make me feel good. And I, I would like it if you stopped it. And what happens is, is the individual, and I've never been wrong in this statement, the individual goes, oh my gosh, I did not know that I was doing that. Thank you very much for telling me. Because the other individual does not want to be mean. Mm -hmm. So in that opportunity, I have an opportunity to stop that negative thought, to stop that real, and then my life shifts and the trajectory begins to change. I've had to do this in my own life. Yes, me too. And so when we do this, this starts to promote good cellular health because then our stress comes down. Then when we go to Christmas, we are an outpouring of love or whether we're on holiday yes. or wherever we go, we're an outpouring of love and joy. And that brings more love and joy to us inside I, of our I really life. love this. This is, this is, I didn't think we'd go this way, but I'm really, I'm really loving this. So I think this is really cool. I've got so many different avenues we could go down, but we'll go down this one. So okay. you're, you're telling me that it, when we're going to like spend time with family at Christmas or we're going on a holiday, anytime you become aware that there's a negative emotion, so you're feeling negative towards the situation, it's, it's either one of two outcomes. Either you're sort of perpetuating it yourself and that's not really necessarily the truth, or you need to establish some kind of boundary and when you do this and you make this clear to someone, and I, I will agree with you, people are so loving, they're so caring, they're so compassionate. As soon as you, like whenever you're stuck or whenever something's going wrong, it's like if you can just be vulnerable and open up and say, like, I'm hurt, immediately that people, they, you, you just see them, the emotion, you just see it come out. And across the board, every single person, every time you do it, they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. Or can I help you in any way? People, people really are lovely they really are good people are really good you just have yeah. to give them the opportunity so right. with the with the boundaries thing this is this is such an important discussion and i know it's something that a lot of my audience will find very interesting a point that you made was that boundaries must be pre-established so it's something that you've decided before you get into the engagement or the environment or the the relationship and i mean, you've already established like maybe this didn't make me feel so good last time and now i'm saying like this is where i'm happy with you taking this to any further than that like that's not okay and you have to know that beforehand and establish it with the person beforehand as well because if they don't know i mean they're not psychic they're, they're just going to go over it so you have to right the boundary is pre-established you have to communicate that with them and this is where you have to take responsibility in something like this 
because people right. can't respect boundaries that you don't establish to them. They're not psychic. Right. So remember, their 80% of their thoughts every day are negative. Yes. So they're worried about coming to Christmas. They're like, oh man, yeah, that Matt guy is going to be there and he's probably going to talk to us about all this stuff. So they're running their own <laughs> negative binge <laughs> reel and I'm running my negative binge yeah. reel and then we come together and it just clashes. Yeah. So the, to say differently is we all vibrate, William. Those books behind you, the statue, yes. the desk is vibrating. They've proven it at MIT. Every inanimate mm -hmm. object vibrates. We are huge vibrational centers. So when you look at vibration, if I'm vibrating at fear, anger, hate, love, that strikes the perpetual cord of anger, hate, frustration in somebody else. Mm -hmm. So because of it, because if you imagine a tuning fork, if I walked into a room with a thousand tuning forks and let's say mine vibrates at 350 hertz, and I strike it on the counter, just holding the tuning fork in the room, every tuning fork in that room that is 350 hertz will vibrate. Mm -hmm. They'll notice it, they start to hum, even though I never touch them. What it is, is like energy attracts like, like energy. So if we really come at this with ourselves, with love, and we approach that conversation with love and kindness and caring, then the other individual can do nothing but vibrate at that same energy that we have. So this is, goes back to that example of 100% of the time, the other individual loves us. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be angry with us. But if we're vibrating in there with frustration and anger and fear, then all of a sudden, that's what we're going to get out of the other individual. But experiment... And what would happen if you actually approached it with love? That's, that's, that's so cool. That's, that's so, so fascinating. So applying that same, that same model, say somebody comes to you and their tuning fork is set to anger, frustration, and they're vibrating that at you and it chimes with you and you feel that that, you know, that gut response, like I'm going to be angry. I'm going to be resentful back. I'm going to project that out. But you manage to catch it. You manage to just not let it come out. And you can then sort of own that. Like, okay, that's evoked within me, but I don't want to choose this. I want to choose something that's more positive, more loving, more kind and considerate. Right. How do you think that would affect the other person's energy? The, you, do you feel like it would have a positive influence on it? Do you think it would just, because they're obviously in a different place, do you think they, would, mm -hmm. it, they wouldn't be able to connect with it? What do you think would happen to them? What, what's fascinating is, is you find the other individual tends to drive towards love or they avoid you. So okay. there's been okay. some relationships in my life that because I'm no longer vibrating at frustration and fear and anger, I no longer attracted that into mm. my life. So for example, let's say there was one person on holiday that you really were just didn't want like they were just toxic. You didn't want to be around them. And what will happen is, is the individual, you know, and this has happened in my life says, oh my gosh, I had a work thing come up. I can't make it. Or even if they did make it, you just find, you just cross each other. You just, you're not connecting mm -hmm. up. You don't enter the same room as them, not intentionally, yeah. but just really as it happens. And this goes back to that element of surprise mm -hmm. is like, oh yeah, wow, that, wow, that happened. Or the other individual will start to have a conversation with me with love. And okay. I've actually been approached at holiday by some individuals that it normally frustrated me. I have a sister that is, you know, I have a difficult time with, and she sat down with me this last time and asked me how I was. And wow. she had never done that in what I'm 45 years old and she had never done that in 42 years. And I'm like, huh, wow, that's, I love it. Once again, surprise. I'm <laughs> like, oh yeah, that was a nice surprise. And so then I had a choice to then return that with love. So this goes into that moment of awareness. If I notice, oh my gosh, this is going, this, um, this is my concern. 
well, then I'm aware of it, aren't I? I'm aware of this moment coming in. So then if I'm aware of it, I get to make a different choice. And if I have looked, worked on my values and I'm like, you know what? I value love. Then I, it seems crazy to me. Why would I approach that with anger? Then all of a sudden I'm aware of it under that. So then I can make a different choice. Mm -hmm. So this goes into the basis of, you know, then really this propagates over into dis disease. So if we have disease, it really is an element of out of balance within body. Mm -hmm. So I'm essentially, I don't love myself. I can't stand in front of a mirror and say, I love you. I don't feel that I am enough. I feel that I have all these issues. So then I'm out of balance with it. Once I am aware that that is the thought coming through, then this is the only way to get out is through. So we've got to walk mm -hmm. through the storm. We have a choice. We can walk around it again. So for example, on holiday with somebody else, we can avoid them, walk around it again, but it doesn't really solve the issue. And get, we just go around it and then we're addressed to come through it. Now, this became a moment of awareness with me is when I was going through my life, all these injuries, paralyzation, the strokes, then multiple sclerosis, as I said in my story, I would have this incident happen, but I wouldn't change my thoughts. I would just go around again mm -hmm. and, I, and I was forced to live it again. So then as I was kept forcing to live it again, it wasn't until I was aware of that, that I could say, oh, that's not what I want. And I could go through the storm. I could walk through it and actually deal with it. And at the beautiful, at the end of this storm is the beautiful light. That is you. Yeah. That is your true authentic self. And then all of a sudden, when we go into these moments, we'll almost forget that we used to think that way. And we'll have statements in our life where we're just happy and we'll hit a moment of awe. I mean, I know, you know, individuals see me today, like I saw a guy in a grocery store I haven't seen in five years. And he asked me how I was doing. And I'm like, Jeff, I'm in awe. I cannot explain it to you. I'm just <laughs> in awe. And, you know, you catch somebody off guard. And I didn't say that you <laughs> yeah. catch them off guard. It's just, I could try to explain it to you. But I, yeah, it's, it's almost mm -hmm. like it doesn't, like really is in a statement of it just is. Mm -hmm. So there is no right or wrong. There just is happening inside our life. And everything that happens in our life is a lesson. It's something where we need to pay attention to. So for example, when I kept getting injured and then finally the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, I was ignoring myself. And my thoughts was, I'm not good enough. I'm stupid. I'm never going to do anything in my life. I'm, you know, my IMs were negative, mm -hmm. which led to stress, which led to dis-ease. And so when I started to become aware of those, then I could walk through each one of them and just be aware and make a different choice of what I wanted to believe that I was. So this, this new model, this new understanding of what disease is, is really in essence, a GPS system that is saying you're off track. We need to go in a different direction. And instead of coming at this disease symptom with medication and trying to turn the volume of the GPS down so it's just not so annoying, instead yeah. we need to change direction in the way that the GPS is trying to tell us to change. Yes. And you'll find this. So I'm running a summit right now with mm -hmm. 24 speakers. 90% of them were diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And every one of them has put it into remission or they live symptom free. And in some cases, individuals are like, yeah, my lesions are gone. And I asked them the one question, do you believe that MS was a gift? And every one of them emphatically says yes. And then mm -hmm. has a story attached to it. Yeah. I would yeah. not be who I am today. So to ask, to answer that question for you is yes, it was mm -hmm. the greatest gift I've ever received yeah. inside my life. Um, I already know the answer to that because I've been there too. Mine's not MS, it's chronic fatigue syndrome, but I'm in the same yeah. camp. But for people that are still struggling out there right now thinking, why is this happening to me? What the hell's going on? When is this going to get better? It's actually happening. It's not happening to you. It's happening for you. 
It's mm. to take you where you want to go because your body knows how to get you there and it's trying to pull you in that direction. Right. And you weren't born with the idea of having a disease. So it's not like, you know, the creator came down and said, oh, William, this is going to be so good. Um, I'm going to give you chronic fatigue syndrome. <laughs> So you're going to have to deal with that. And then, you know what? You're going to have struggle over here and that's going to be fun to watch. No, no, no. I mean, we don't have a <laughs> smitten, you know, judgeful God or, you know, creator in our world is really is we create it. Once we realize, and I love what you said, it is not happening to us. It is happening for us in this whole basis of everything we want. So this is where individuals cure themselves from cancer through laughter. These are individuals that go through a serious diagnosis and come out the other end, a different person, but healed because they've decided that this is happening for me. What do I need to pay attention to? What am I not listening to right now that I should be listening to and really go in into this moment of awareness, this moment of, okay, yeah, you know what? I get really upset at X. Okay, that's, that's fine. Then once I'm aware that I get upset at X, then all of a sudden I can consciously make a different decision. So what happens is just under that basis with stress, I can put you under a minor amount of stress by uh, giving a series of numbers. Like I could run through an exercise right now mm -hmm. and everybody will respond. I've done this exercise to thousands of people and everybody responds the same way. It's because your brain is really designed to go on automatic thought process through long-term memory and thought. So today, being that we're young, we're young, we've been always trained that if you're sick, go to the doctor. The doctor is right. The doctor has the answer. But with multiple sclerosis or chronic fatigue syndrome, they're guessing. They're essentially looking at it and they're like, well, this is what we see in our research and in science. So this is what we think you should do. So for example, with multiple sclerosis is this is what we see in our research that it's B cell, T cell, and they're attacking your brain, autoimmune condition that's coming through your body. So what we want to do is we want to suppress your immune system. Oh, by the way, 38% of the people we give this drug to, it makes them worse. And for everybody else, nothing. And you got a 27% chance this is not going to cure it, but halt the progression of it. So you're kind of stacking the odds against you in a way. I remember looking at my neurologist and saying, if I gave you a 27% chance, you make it home safe from the office. Do you leave? And so we all know the answer that, no, I'm not going to leave the office. I'm going to try everything else I can do. So really under that basis is because in our minds, we have given an authority figure to a doctor, not saying they're wrong, not saying they're bad, not saying doctors by any means haven't cured. And trust me, if I get in a car accident, William, take me to the doctor. Yeah, I agree. Don't take me to an energy healer. Yeah, I had the... As soon as I did this, it was like, yeah, let's go to A&A. &E. <laughs> they know what they're doing. Yeah, exactly. And they, you need to fix this. Yeah. And so they can fix the machine. But when it comes up to neurologically in there, mm -hmm. now, granted, they've done beautiful research and all this, but they still don't have the reason. It's a complex puzzle. And I can understand why uh, it's a struggle to piece it together because it really does require an awareness that I don't feel you can obtain purely through science. It's, there's some things you cannot just explain with the research and studies. There's a magic to healing. There's an element of surprise that you cannot predict with science. And they're never gonna find that because that's not what they're looking for. Yeah, and you're very well said. <laughs> is that this is something that they don't. So we go to the doctor's office and they say, take this drug. And we say, no. Then they somewhat at some point put us in a level of shame and fear. So imagine leaving that doctor's office given a diagnosis like chronic fatigue syndrome or multiple sclerosis and 
the amount of fear that you are in in that moment is the most fear I've ever experienced in my life. Well, fear equals stress. And stress equals disease. So now all of a sudden they put me in a state of stress. Then the doctor comes in and says, well, if you don't take this, you're going to be in a wheelchair in seven months. Fear once again. And so it just perpetuates and it continues down this cycle. And my belief that I can heal a disease just gets suppressed and it goes down and down. So this, you know, the energy, the love, that all the everything that I talked about is like, you're crazy. I wouldn't do that. Like, why the heck would I discredit a doctor? Because for the last, however long you've been on this planet, you've been told if you're sick, go to a doctor. So now under this premise is we don't trust ourselves, food, herbals, energy, love inside of our lives to help us heal that disease. So even if somebody decides to take a disease modifying drug, which is fine, if we have the fear that it's going to make us worse, we have a higher chance of that drug making us worse. But if we truly believe that that drug is going to heal us, then it will. Take a look at Dr. Joe Dispenza and the work that he Mm -hmm, does when he starts to walk down this road. The placebo effect is real. I mean, when he they when they gave the placebo, forty percent of the individuals that received the placebos actually showed improvement from the placebo mm-hmm. because they thought mm-hmm. that they were receiving the drug. I think the the concept of placebo has a strong negative connotation because people are thinking like, oh, well, they're just making it happen with their mind. It's like, how's that a bad thing? You know, that's a that's a great right. thing. It means you don't need right. the drug. You can just do it if you think it, kind of thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. And and rightfully so. So then, you know, this concept of everything that you have inside your life, disease, family, your house, relationships, children, everything in your life is due to your sphere of possibility. It's what you believe is possible. This is why 78% of lottery winners go back to where they were Mm-hmm. prior to winning the lottery. Mm-hmm. So if I win 20 million in the lottery, I mean, that'd be enough money to take me the rest of my life, right? I wouldn't have to work again. I could live off of the dividends of that money. But if all I've ever experienced is living in a tent or trailer my entire life, and I'm negative and I'm discrediting and the man is bringing me down and all of this stuff. And I win $20 million within five years, I'm going to go back to living in my trailer and a tent because that's all I really can conceptualize in my sphere of possibility. So let's say anything outside of our sphere of possibility, healing, for example, is there I want to heal from my desires to heal from multiple sclerosis. If it is not in something I believe is possible, then once again, I won't change my mindset. I won't change my behavior. I won't change my words. I won't change what I eat, which expands my sphere of possibility to allow healing to enter into Mm -hmm. it. This is a prerequisite for me. When I work with somebody, I ask them, do you think you can heal? Mm. And if they tell me no, it's like, well, you can't then. Why are you coming to talk? I can't do anything for you. If you right. don't believe it, you can't do it. <laughs> but the mm-hmm. thing is, it works on the other side too. You believe you can yeah. heal? Fantastic, let's do it. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> right, because if you believe you can do it, you will do it. Yeah. The power so of when I finished Iron Man. I had a paralyzed leg. If I didn't think I could do all that activity in one day, truly believe it, I would have never finished it. Never done it. Iron Man is 70% mental. That's, I, mean, but, but I love that. <laughs> That's so true. You got to yeah. wrap your mind yeah. around. I've got in wow. your training puts you in that space of doing it. Wow. And so really under this is if you believe you can, and I love that you asked that question, you will. You will find everything you can. 
But let's say what you're healing, and you pointed to this early on, let's say what you're healing is not the disease, but really it's the self. It's healing love within your heart. Healing other aspects. That's why, you know, healing is not, we think about it from that physical level. I want to be back to where I was before. My life before the disease. Maybe that's not what you're healing. Maybe what you're healing is bigger than that. Mm -hmm. Maybe what you're healing is the love you have for yourself. The love that we outwardly pour out. Maybe it's this healing of this aspect that is not on the physical plane, but it's something much deeper. And through that healing of something much deeper, your body responds and heals the disease. Lovely. Okay, so taking it from here, what is something that anybody listening can do, preferably for free or if very, 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 very cost effectively? Mm-hmm. Anybody in any situation, if they have MS, if they have CFS, whether they have, whether they're completely healthy, what can they do right now to improve the direction and the trajectory of their health and their life right now? Be aware of your thoughts. Be aware of your thoughts. Yes, it's how, So how, I know it's, it's, it's very simple, right? But how yeah. do you go about that? How do you achieve that? Because that's not an easy thing to, to mm-hmm. do. I, yeah, I love the concepts that are super simple logically, but when we actually go <laughs> yes. to dig into it, it's like, what the? Yeah. Just so love really yourself being, more, you know? It's like, what the? Yeah. <laughs> being aware of your thoughts. And, you know, your thoughts could be on a level of judgment. So judgment of self or judgment of others. So every time have a piece of paper with you, just carry around a piece of paper. If you get in the habit of carrying around a really simple journal, you can put in your purse, back pocket, wherever it is. And any time you catch yourself judging somebody, you're ultimately judging yourself Mm -hmm. or even judging yourself saying, man, why did you do that? You're so stupid. Write it down. Just write down the thought. So it's, again, it's that awareness piece. Don't have to do anything to it. Just write it down. Just read, yeah. And you're saying, as you become more and more aware, you sort of begin to say like, oh, well, actually, I'm actually quite horrible to myself and I'm going to stop doing that because I'm I'm now aware of how awful I am. And if anyone else treated me like that, I wouldn't be friends with them. So why do I do that to myself? And then you stop. So then you can make a choice. You know what? I'm going to be nicer to myself. I am really smart. You know, I just missed that turn. I'm not dumb. I just missed the turn. Yeah. Just okay. is. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, final question. So say you step into an elevator and you, you, you find yourself next to someone of incredible influential power in the government, in the way the country is run. Mm-hmm. You've got 30 seconds before they've reached their floor. What do you tell them to try to improve the health of the nation? Mm. <laughs> that's a that's a really good question <laughs> you know really all i could do in that moment i'm not going to change somebody else's perception in 30 seconds so all i could do is love them i love and, that <laughs> is really just look at them and say hey i know who you are i just want to let you know how difficult your life is and how difficult your job is i just want you to know i love you and um would i like to see things done differently yeah i would But really with this is think about me, think about others like me when you're going to make that decision. Just, I love you in all of these aspects of your life and um, good luck. I'd really love that. So instead of, instead of trying to call on their, the logic and giving them advice, you're trying to call on their humanity because that's really where they're acting from on a, on a daily basis in their job. So really evoking that. Right. humanity i love that that's a fantastic answer and what happens is is the other individual you know unbeknownst to me maybe i hit a trigger in them maybe i hit a chord that they said man i don't he, he was right like what i'm doing is not good for mm-hmm. people and maybe they started to make a little maybe they just i sparked a moment of awareness within them and they allow that thread to grow inside of their lives they just needed that little bit of love just a little bit of love lovely 
So for anybody listening that wants to find out more about you and what you do and your events that you're hosting, would you tell them, tell them how they can get in contact with you and share any information that you would, that you would like to share? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wrote a book this year. It's called Belief to Heal. Um, it's on Amazon. You just go to Belief to Heal um, and you search it in Amazon and it'll pop up. So um, I'm really, I love the book. It's in, not just because I wrote it on an <laughs> egotistical you know, standpoint. It's the individuals that read it and call me and they're like, this resonated. This was in this book will show up in your life when you need it. Mm -hmm. That if you're drawn to it, you will order it, you will read it. And so there's all these different ways to do that. So definitely belief to heal, um, get a copy. Um, the other one is, is I'm hosting the symptom free MS summit summit starting June 20th, 2022. This summit will happen every year for the next 40 years. Brilliant. This is the first annual one, but I've pulled together 24 speakers. That's how we met. I actually yes. reached out to you, William, yeah. and wanted you to speak at the yeah. summit. And so in these basis is everything that I'm doing in there is giving individuals hope on a first step. So like I said, we have doctors, we've got Matthew Embry, we've got fitness, David, you know, when we look at everything that we're doing with all these pieces, all the speakers I have is we are going to introduce possibly six different modalities of healing. I have energy healers. I've got doctors. I've got fitness gurus. I've got, you know, individual like motivators, like Matthew Embry, like all of these individuals in the room. And it's a 12 day summit. And every day you will receive two talks a day equaling 24 and some days may have three people speaking. So at 6 a.m. I release the section of talks. I leave it live for 24 hours. And then the next day, the next group comes out. And so what's beautiful about this is we at this point right now have 600 people signed up for the summit. And with that is we are allowing individuals to look and discover a different way on how to heal multiple sclerosis and live a symptom free life. Wow. And so I get super excited about that one. That was action that intuitively came to me when that like, Oh, I want to make a difference. I want to do something. I want to do something. And then a couple months ago, I woke up to this thought of holding a summit or having something inside my life. And then the right people, opportunities and events happen to allow this moment to happen to help influence 600 plus people. We're on a trajectory to hit 3,500 people in the summit, helping them live a life that is beautiful and not be defined by the disease. Wow, that's amazing. So all of that, you'll have links. I know there was a few links there. So all of this will be available in the little description box below. So if you want anything that Matt just described there, there's a link for it below. So just go down there, have a look. You'll be able to find it there, okay? Awesome. So that was that, I, I, that. That speech at the end was really nice. I really loved it. It's really tuning into the to the to the heart chords, you know, because <laughs> you really can live a life symptom free. You really can get to a point where, and I, I'll even say I'm not symptom free yet, but I'm at the point where I don't actually want my symptoms to go away because I know they're actually doing something that serves me in a in a very very good way. So I know they'll be ready to go when I'm ready for them to go, and I'm really at peace with that. And that's a, that's a really nice place to be. So. It's, it's not just a theory, you know, you can, you can yeah. do that. You can get to a place where you have no symptoms or you're even more than happy to have them. Uh, and it's a really, it's a really different perspective mindset wise to have when you're happy to have a symptom, you know, it, it sounds kind of crazy, but you can, you can yeah. really get there. So you can really change that relationship. You can really find healing and it's absolutely possible. I've done it. Matt's doing it. And there's thousands of experts that have achieved the same. So Absolutely. I just want to thank you, Matt, for coming on. It was really lovely to have you. It's been really fun. I've really enjoyed this. So thank you. I'm sure we'll have you on again. And um, I'm going to ask you for some more information about the, the MS Summit after, after we finish up. Awesome. Thank you so much, William, for this opportunity. It's absolutely beautiful. My pleasure. It's been, you've been a fantastic guest. Really happy to have you. Thank you. See you sometime soon, Matt. Thanks for Sounds coming. Good. Ciao. 
You've been listening to the Holistic Healing Collective with William Dickinson. Our passion is to heal with energy, holistic, and plant medicine using a science-based blend of mind, body, and spirit. We hope you've enjoyed the show, and we hope you've gotten some useful and practical information. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and tell a friend or two. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, find us on Facebook at the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast and Support Group. We'd love to see you. Take care, be well, and see you next time on the Holistic Healing Collective.